Can everybody hear me okay? So before I begin, I just wanted to start a little, uh, just to introduce those of you who are not very familiar with the High Desert Museum. It's in Bend, Oregon. Um, we are a, a museum that focuses on the cultural and natural history of the High Desert region, which includes the Great Basin, Columbia Plateau, Snake River Plain, and even from an ecological point of view, also the Wyoming Basin and uh, Colorado Plateau. So it's a, um, a, a big area, but we're focused on the, the flora and fauna of that area. And although we do most of our exhibits and programs, obviously within our property, we do try to strategically participate in some work with the resource outside of our property and, and, and focus on issues or, or questions or um, wildlife monitoring needs that, that maybe we can fill a gap with, with our limited resources. So this is one question that um, you know, felt like we were given our location in Bend and, and close to Central Oregon and Eastern Oregon that we could maybe assist with. And it's a question that has been uh, in, the, in, the, in the wildlife community for some time. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit today or tonight about just, we're gonna go over a primer of, of, of lead science with respect to birds of prey. Um, I know there's probably a mixed group here of, of, very, of some people who are very knowledgeable about this and some people that don't have a big background. So we're gonna talk about that. Talk about some of the, the Oregon research underway. And I'm gonna talk, give, provide some preliminary uh, um, results from some work we're doing in collaboration with USGS and Fish and Wildlife Service, but it is preliminary, so I want to just emphasize that, that this is not information that is, it, we're distributing yet, um, so it is preliminary results. Uh, and then talk a little bit about the implications and future research questions that this work is prompting or, or, or posing. And then finally, very briefly, uh, just to, for those of you that that are new to the subject, I wanted to you know, try to provide some information about uh, alternative ammunitions, which is, which is of course an important part of this, this subject. So, and, and you know, I presented this information to a couple different groups and, and as a biologist or any wildlife manager, this subject makes you know, resource people gulp a little bit because it has some political overtones. Um, so, you know, I'm a hunter. It's a picture of my horse in Wyoming after an elk hunt. And in, in, in lead science, as being somebody who's a biologist interested in raptors and a hunter, it's a fairly natural thing, question to want to ask. You see things in the field. You watch eagles scavenging gut piles. You watch, you know, birds scooping up ground squirrels. And it, so it's not, this is about science. This is about being a biologist and about, you know, seeing things in the field and being concerned whether or not how that may be affecting the resource. It's not about you know, not having a grudge about hunting. And most of the raptor research community out there are hunters. So that's just something that shouldn't have to be said maybe, but I, I, I find it, you know, maybe we should say it just for those folks that may be concerned about that. And what's interesting about lead also is I was reading a paper by uh, Tom Cade, who's the, who's the founder of the Peregrine Fund, who was writing a, really a critique of this subject. And, and he quoted the founder of toxicology, if we were to judge of, of the interest excited by any medical subject by the number of writings in which it has given birth, we could not but regard the poisoning by lead as the most important to be known of all those that have been treated of up to the present time. So this is 1817. Lead, lead, lead toxicology or to the study of lead and toxicology is an old subject dating back to the Romans. Um, and so here we are. The first real um, body of lead science with respect to, to birds was in waterfowl, and that was primary poisoning. So we're talking about waterfowl that are ingesting pellets, lead pellets primarily, shotgun pellets, um, directly. So they're just ingesting either shotgun pellets or ammunition or uh, sinkers, fishing tackle. And so there's a great big body of work dating back to the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, into the 80s uh, looking into this. Um, and of course, there was a ban on using lead ammunition for waterfowl hunting in 1991. I was a freshman in college, and I was a duck hunter back then. And I have to admit, even at the time, I was a little upset about that. But because you know we hunted black ducks and sea ducks, and, and it seemed to be a very uh, negative outcome for hunting, but you know we got around it and figured out how to use that ammunition. But the next wave is secondary poisoning, and, and the research in the 80s and 90s and into the present day has looked at uh, birds of prey scavenging various lead shot carcasses, gut piles, what have you. And so there's been a large body of research uh, up to now, but in the, in the middle of the last century, 
We didn't know this, and so the, what, an interesting quote, you know, when I read Wildlife in America by Peter Matheson, which is a great book, he uh, reflected the, con the, the, that understanding at the time was that the California condor was this relic, that the reason it was um, becoming extirpated in, in various regions in the 20th century was likely due to essentially it's just a relic of the Pleistocene. And what we know now, of course, is that that, at least in the second half of the 20th century, it's lead poisoning. It's, it's, that's the deal. Um, so, you know, it, starting with a lot of this information was prompted by rehabilitation centers and, and those, of, those centers that were an, analyzing carcasses, uh, taking x-rays, doing blood lead analysis. And so that's what prompted a lot of the re research. And, but, uh, the biases, however, prompt also the need to go into the field and actually in a non-random way, or in a random way, and non-biased way, sample wild populations because the, the information gained from these rehab records are really critical, but you need to get into the field to try to get a, a true sense of the risk or a true sense of the, the rates of lead poisoning. So if you're retrieving birds, bringing them to rehab centers, this could be highly variable. People in one county might be very good about reporting birds on the ground. People in another county may just drive right by them. Uh, Pre-existing conditions, so if a bird is compromised, the, the birds coming into rehab centers can be compromised from a myriad of other ailments. That can predispose them to be scavenging at different rates than wild, normally healthy birds. And then the, 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 one of the tools we use is this lead care machine, and which is really a great little machine for a reasonable price, but there's some validating that needs to be done by species, because we're not sure how accurate that is for, say, if it, if it reads X for a condor at, say, 10 micrograms per deciliter, and you're up at 100, is that a true figure compared to the mass, spectrometry, mass spectrometer readings? So here, you know, I'll talk a little bit about how scientists look at that, or measure lead in birds um, and in other wildlife, but there's three main tools. Blood lead, looking at lead in blood, which is a very important tool. Feathers, th tissues like liver, and then bone. So bone will show the lifetime exposure of the animal, but that's a lethal take thing, or you, you're, you're recovering carcasses, essentially. So, in order to evaluate a bird that you're going to release, you really only have two options, is blood and, to a lesser extent, feather. And what's so important about blood is, that, is the depuration rate. So lead in blood uh, essentially has this very con consistent, or within certain species, rate where it goes from when it's exposed, that's, say, the level when the bird was exposed, and then after a certain three weeks or so, it's pretty much down to three to four weeks, it's, it's down to uh, almost nothing. What's so important about that is that when you catch a bird and you take blood and it has a, a whatever level, an elevated level, you know that that bird was exposed within a couple of weeks. And so that's a very important tool to evaluate a vector. Well, where did this bird get it from? You know, you can start to figure things out that way. So that's, taking blood is very important and, and, and looking at lead in blood is very important. So since then, some of these studies, you know, going out into the field and evaluating wild populations uh, in the course of uh, the last, really, the last 10 years have shown very strong, or, or 20 years, very strong correlation with elevated blood lead during the fall big game hunting season in places like the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and around the California condors range. Also, there's been a number of studies that have experimentally shot carcasses or various, you know, of carcasses of various types and, and documented this fragmentation, and we'll talk about that later. But lead, lead, lead bullet fragmentation in, in carcasses in gut piles. And this literature is prolific, so uh, even though there's some controversy around this subject, it's, there's a lot of really good research out there, especially in these two subjects. But there's other vectors that are less understood. Uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that. So we know big game hunting seasons are correlated with exposure to certain scavenging birds in certain parts of the country, for sure. We know it's the deal with you know, certain scavenging raptors. But there's other vectors we don't know. Here, and to give an example, uh, 
some lead research with California Condor Program. This is a very robust uh, data set. In, in the Kaibab Plateau, it's about 51.8% of all diagnosed deaths are lead. That's an incredible chunk of mortality based on one cause is lead. And it's all of those spikes, all of that, that, that poisoning, that lethal dose is happen tends to happen in these two months every year. And so, you know, that's a very, that's why going again, that deparation rate, lead, you know, leaves the blood in about three to four weeks. So you have this great ability to correlate exposure with a time of year. And so, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but that those crews, the Peregrine Fund crews on the Kaibab have to chelate most of all those wild birds. They have to trap them, chelate them at twice a year, which is to chemically remove lead and blood in order to keep that population alive. And, you know, and they're, they're seeing uh, drops in blood lead in those populations in, recently. So that's something that's in the, been in the news. And here is a, you know, a graph that really visually shows it the best. Um, these are exposure thresholds. So this is, uh, I think, background, and this is elevated, and this is clinical poisoning. Or, and, and so you can see these peaks are straight up on top of essentially October, November, December every year. And th this has been an increasing, kind of increasing, but if you look into, say, 2014, or, you know, they're actually showing some decrease. But, but it's, a, it's a pretty remarkable spike on those months. And there's also been research chemically linking ammunition stocks and types of alloys with, um, so that they've, they've linked this chemically, not just correlated it tempor temporally. And another great um, group is Beringia South out of the Greater Yellowstone. They're, they're out of Jackson Hole and um, Derek Craighead and Brian Bedrosian here, who are really expert at this. They've been studying this phenomenon in bald eagles, golden eagles, and ravens in the Greater Yellowstone. And they did a real, one of their most recent papers. They did an experimental study, not just the fact that they're monitoring blood lead in these species, but in eagles, they um, they actually made available non-lead ammunition to about 33% of the hunters in their study area starting here. So those black bars are the total harvested animals and the white bars are the, the lead, the animals harvested by lead. And you can see that what that reflects is that in those two years, more, there was this many hunters used non-lead. And uh, what they saw is a very strong correlation with a drop in lead levels in those birds. So with respect to, the point being with respect to big game hunting and that phenomenon in certain regions of this country where they're studying this, it's a very strong, there's a lot of strong information out there. And so I'll just talk a little bit about the sort of the, the nuts and bolts of bullets um, briefly. The, the, the main reason um, that these fragments are, are essentially getting into and being consumed is the design of a typical bullet, um, and I'm just going to talk about uh, big game ammunition now, but they're mostly a lead core with a copper jacket, and they're designed to mushroom a certain way to deliver more energy and impact uh, to be more effective. But in doing so, they lose a lot of their mass, particularly in the front half of the bullet. That lead that's up there gets fragments out, um, and then you have this, the, the back half of the bullet that remains. And so this is, I think, a bullet shot into a water barrel, and those are all the lead particles. Here is a gelatin, a ballistic gel, and you can see this track is a lead bullet, and all those little specks are fragments, and this track is a non-lead bullet, and that track's a non-lead bullet. So. And then some radiographs, some x-rays, and there's a lot of this stuff out there online, but this is a ground squirrel out of our study area that was shot. Um, a, a professor at COCC did a lot of these radiographs. Um, here's one shot by a 22, when people say, well, the 22s don't really fragment, but that's a marmot. You know, there's quite a few fragments right there. This is the neck of a deer. And so raptors, you know, when we give our bird of prey talks, we, we deal with the subject every day. We give anywhere from two to five bird of prey talks a day at the museum. We talk about this, just like we talk about electrocution or any other thing. And uh, when, we, you know, when we talk about it, what is important to remember is that the physiology of a bird of prey, the proventriculus, uh, 
it's, and, and even in the gizzard, is very powerful compared to humans. So they can, um, when they consume these fragments, unlike an owl, which cannot cons dissolve bone, an eagle can dissolve the femur of a jackrabbit. You know, a falcon can dissolve all the bones in a, in a songbird or whatever. So when they, when they ingest, most diurnal raptors that digest lead or ingest lead, they are very high chance that they're going to dissolve that, those particles um, into the, and it's more readily available into their, to their bloodstream. I mean, I have no question I've eaten a lot of lead and I've probably suffered for it, but humans don't have as powerful of a digestive system. So this is kind of just a little diagram that, hopes, that explains, this is a widely documented thing in the literature, fall carcasses and offals that are rifle shot or, 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 or you know, lead, lead, lead shot. But what, there's all this unknown in, in the, the research community. What are the questions that haven't really been looked at? And some of them are just random point source shooting. This was Christmas Valley two weeks ago. My, my field tech or biologist, um, who's on, my, on the staff at the museum, took this photo in Christmas Valley. This is uh, shot coyotes that have been dumped. And you know, eagles are on those carcasses. You'll see three or four eagles on each one. Yeah. And there's a lot of those out there. So that's po random point source. Then you have things like wildlife damage and protection, livestock protection. They, when you're doing an airport work, say, and you work for wildlife services, you can drive right up to that deer and load it onto your pickup bed. Some wildlife um, service groups and some uh, wildlife damage groups will retreat, make it a policy to retrieve carcasses or to use non-lead. Uh, they have to for migratory birds, but they don't have to for other things. Uh, but if you're doing, whoops, if you're doing aerial, aerial operations and you're out over BLM land and, and you know, shooting coyotes, probably you're not gonna retrieve those carcasses or it's less, it's less likely. But we don't know what, what that, we, we just don't know. And then the, the question that we chose to look at more closely is, is the spring and early summer ground squirrel shooting uh, activity, which is you know, a growing activity. It's a growing in popularity. Um, I noticed a lot of it when I was in Montana with respect to prairie dogs also. And so, the, so this is, these are some of the gaps in the, the scientific literature, is this whole area here. You know, going back to if you're a wildlife manager and you're looking at this and evaluating this as a, as a biologist or a manager, looking at this for the hunter, the big game hunting season is very predictable. There's hunters go out there opening day, you know when opening day is, you know when day, this hunting season closes. It's essentially usually public land. It's, it's in, in this you know, specific time of year. Um, it's usually in wildland regions that are separated from other causes or sources. And, uh, you know, so it's an easier thing to evaluate if you're just looking at just from a practical point of view. And it's controlled, which is also important. Because you know the, uh, you know, you have, a, a, you have an idea of the intensity of the, of the scale. But, you know, going back to rehabilitation records, which have been very important, this is Gary Landers and Lynn Tompkins in 2012. A lot of the eagles and budios they brought in and, and actually measured were having these incredible high, like, you know, this is, this is clinical poisoning right here. This was, you know, March, April, May, June, and maybe one bird in July. That's pretty, you know, that's kind of interesting. That, that, that's sort of something that hadn't really been observed in a lot of areas. And in the condor project, there was these little spikes here, you know, May, June, July. What's that about? hunting season hadn't even started yet. So that's, these are some of the things we were interested in is, you know, what is that about? That's in Oregon. And so looking at ag lands and ground squirrels and lead exposure, um, places like central and eastern Oregon, it's pivot agriculture, alfalfa, hay agriculture, irrigated agriculture. You have very concentrated prey and habitat. So that's good if you're a biologist trying to study it. Also, it's important to realize that it's ecological service for farmers. You know, they're not going to use as much rodenticide if, with the shooting activity. So, you know, it's a growing industry, ground squirrel shooting. It's growing in popularity, and it can provide a service for, for those of farmers. But, it, you know, it can produce hundreds of ground squirrels on the, the pivot per, per shooter day easily. 
but it's difficult to measure this risk as opposed to the big game work in the fall when you're out in the Forest Service lands is that, you know, this is very eruptive population, so you might have one year the ground squirrels are down in Christmas Valley, one year they're booming in Crane. Uh, it's private land, so you may not be able to get on there. Um, and then it's very, you know, very inconsistent. I mean, it may be very popular in one place and not at all in another place. And then it's totally uncontrolled. There's no license required. So again, you know, thinking as it, from just the point of gathering information, it's, it's a difficult job. And, uh, and feel free to ask any questions while I'm rambling on here. But looking at the literature, what, what little had been done is we know that there's a lot of, you know, in experimental studies, that there's a lot of uh, fragments in carcasses. So most of the carcasses that have been shot had lead fragments. We, that research has been done. Um, and a lot of those fragments, can, or a lot of those carcasses contained enough fragments to be lethal to a, a raptor nestling, for example. So some of, there, there has been some literature looking into that. But few studies have directly gone out and sampled raptors with respect to varmint hunting, like ground squirrel prairie dog shooting. That, that had not really been done. One person in, in Wyoming looking at Frugian Sox. So, so uh, with some collaborators here, uh, USGS the, uh, and Colin Eagle Smith with the, with the USGS, Garth Herring and Colin Eagle Smith, and then Jeremy Buck with the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and the High Desert Museum. We, we were both kind of at the same time asking this question and we joined forces um, to look at this. You know, is ground squirrel shooting a vector for lead exposure in avian scavengers in Oregon? And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And, and again, it's preliminary data, so uh, we're, we're not ready to release the information and they're not ready to publish until they have uh, validated the results with a mass spectrometer. We ha the results I'm gonna show you today are based on this lead care machine. That's a very accurate machine, but you know, as a matter of policy, it's best to validate it. So ground squirrel shooting, it's, uh, we wanted to survey the avian scavengers pre and post shooting. So get an idea of the use of, of these, irrigate, these pivots in respect to shooting. And we wanted to figure out time budgets to determine, well, how are they using it? Are they scavenging? Are they hunting? Are they flying by? And then to finally actually measure it, capture the birds, take blood in relation to these, this activity, this shooting activity. And so our study area was Christmas Valley and Crane, and this winter we added Willamette Valley. Hopefully we'll get some samples there, and we're gonna try to go down into Klamath Basin as well um, this winter. But, but the, what I'm gonna show you are, are these two areas tonight. And so what we saw was just the numeric response was very dramatic. A lot more birds go to the fields after there's been a shooting event. And so this is what we called shooting or versus no shooting is had there been shooting within two days. That's how we identified that. And I think the sample size here is, is several hundred birds. Um, I just took a lot of that out of this presentation. Um, just want to bore you with statistics. But um, the next thing we looked at is uh, hunting. So what we found is that birds in shooting fields spend 240% less time hunting. They are not hunting, they are you know, obviously doing other things. The feeding response. Again, 260% more time feeding, essentially scavenging, at, at the shooting fields versus the non-shooting fields. So this is you know, giving, painting a picture of what's going on in the pivot, and this is not, when you're out there, it's not rocket science, it doesn't take a genius biologist when you, to see what happens. We, we, uh, went to one of our shoots where there was probably about a thousand carcasses out there and we were labeling them with an isotope, I'll get into that later. But what we, when we labeled about as many as we could, which was about 500, and we put them out in the dark, um, the next morning we all went back and as the sun rose, by 10 o'clock the avian community had removed all of them. So that's three, four hours, gulls, ravens, budios, eagles, they're gone. So it, it's a, it's a, when you're out there it's very dramatic. And so I'll, you know, I have a few data slides with the lead, lead expo this is an exposure threshold, and I'll try a uh, graph, and I'll try to explain this, but 
for ravens, we saw essentially 40% of all the ravens sampled had lead exposure. And then these are the, th the, the thresholds here. So um, black is background. That means it's less than 10 micrograms per deciliter. Uh, elevated is 10 to 20. Subclinical poisonings, 20 to 50. And over 50 is considered clinical. We'll talk a little bit about what those mean because we're not really sure what they mean. They're just based on the available science and the peer-reviewed science. This is sort of what people are using, but we don't know by each species what it means physiologically, if it applies. So 40%, though, you know, it's a lot of those ravens had lead. Swainson's hawks was, were the next, um, and they, they, uh, they seem to be, when they come out of migration, they, a lot, they do a lot of scavenging. And this is not a, re a red tail. But you have to excuse me there. That's another Swainson's hawk. But anyway, red-tailed red hawks had 7%. And then we had some birds we just didn't have enough of a sample size on. Prairie falcons, rough-legged hawks, and fruginous hawks. Fruginous hawks are really hard to catch. Um, so they were 6% pooled together. And then this is compared to some statewide work that Garth and Colin did around the state of Oregon uh, compared to our study sites. And so going back to that rehabilitation records, a lot of rehab centers have recorded much higher levels in their data sets, but that can maybe give you an idea of, you know, birds that are coming into rehab centers might be biased high because they're complicated, there's secondary conditions going on that might predispose them to scavenging. So for the ravens, and this is over time, and this is some of the questions that we're really still kind of trying to think, figure out, and, and, and it's causing us to look at our efforts in the oncoming years. Ravens, if you remove these, this little cluster here, this would basically be a flat line of, so lead levels over time. It shows that it fell, but what we think this is in relation to is the height of alfalfa. The alfalfa was so high that they, they're not gonna, people aren't shooting, and if they're shooting, the carcasses aren't very visible. So, um, but what's interesting is there's a lot of lead exposure really early in the year before, you know, so we're, we realize that we need to be sampling out here to get a better idea, or even through the whole year. We're just not really sure. We, you know, I expected, to be honest with you, kind of a bell curve that was tightly correlated with that shooting activity, because ground squirrel shooting happens really, most of it, about right, right there. But between the study sites, Crane had a lot you know, there's much higher levels in Crane, or significantly higher levels in Crane for ravens compared to Christmas Valley. Christmas Valley, there was very little shooting that year. They were doing a lot of rodenticide, a lot of poisoning, and Crane had a very heavy, highly, very intense shooting levels in Crane. For raptors, um, we didn't see any effect on date on concentrations, which again, real surprise to us. We don't know what that means, so that's why we're trying to look at the year and go out and yeah. Just out of curiosity, does the rodenticide pass through to the uh, avian population? What's that? Does the rodenticide pass through to the avian population? Is there any effect on that? That's a good question. Some of those um, chemicals are applied in a way that uh, should minimize that. Like a ground squirrel eats it, it drinks some water, it go, it's underground, a badger might eat it after it has been dead for some time. Most of those chemicals are designed to uh, break down over time. Um, after, essentially by the time the animal's dead, they, the, the chemical is dissipated, like zinc phosphide, I believe. Um, but there's a high chance that a lot of raptors are, are actually, for hunting raptors, are actually hunting and killing live ground squirrels that had been recently exposed to rodenticide. There's some tests that you can look at that, but we know what those tests are. I don't know that, I think Garth and Colin might be gonna, might look at some of those levels with rodenticide, but it's not something that we currently have the funding to do. So, um, you know, with raptors, unlike ravens, the, the concentrations were similar between study sites, which was also interesting. Here's a rough-legged hawk. We just trapped that bird 10 days ago uh, that, that had elevated levels. You know, so I'll talk a little about maybe why that is, um, you know, a little bit later. But that was, that was a little, we're, we're just thinking that there's multiple vectors going on. It's a, it's a complicated story. Um, but here's a Swainson's hawk that was very high uh, it was pegged to lead care machine, but the bird acted normal, flew away normal. So again, what does this mean? I mean, it's really difficult to know what 
70 micrograms per deciliter means to a Swainson talk? Does it, you know, we don't know. But they did differ. Those concentrations differed among species during our study. And turkey vultures, um, Garth got some turkey vultures that were, of course, that's expected that they'd be higher. But the Swainson's hawks were the next, you know, in the Budio group, the Swainson's hawks appear to be the, the most vulnerable. And I think we only caught three rough leggeds, and out of the three, like two were, had, had background levels of lead. So I'm kind of interested about rough leggeds because I think they sit on carcasses just like eagles in the wintertime. You know, we've observed that. Um, as opposed, you don't think of Budios as sitting on a, a roadkill deer and eating it. But rough leggeds do do that in the wintertime. And red tails sometimes, and other birds. But. So uh, just what are we going to do in the future? Some of these results um, have led us to realize that we need to expand our, our temporal effort. We need to get out there in the fall and the winter. And, uh, when ground squirrels are not active, so that's what we're currently doing right now. Um, I've got a bi biologist that's in the field today or tonight um, out there doing it. And we need to be you know, doing it in places where ground squirrels are absent that time of year, like in Crane in the winter, but also in places like Willamette Valley where there's no ground squirrels um, as a sort of control. And we need to expand the spatial effort, maybe like I mentioned, whoops, Willamette Valley, but also uh, I wanna get into Klamath Basin as well. And Garth and Colin are doing some isotope work, and this is really cool. So basically, if you catch a raptor, you, know, you, you label your carcasses with an isotope, a nitrogen isotope, and uh, you capture a raptor and it's labeled, you know that raptor ate that ground squirrel that we labeled, for sure. So there's no argument about it. But you also know, let's say you were 15 miles away from where you labeled the, the carcasses on a pivot, and you catch a bird 15, 20 miles away that's labeled, that also gives you an idea of you know, one shooting activity and one pivot could actually have a much bigger effect or a smaller effect than we realize, we don't know. But that isotope work can actually help document that. And they're also, Colin and Garth are also doing some really good work with x-rays or x-raying carcasses and they're digesting them to actually extract the, the particles, the lead particles, and measure them. And then to look at other tissues, so if we have mortalities or um, other things to look at lifetime exposure instead of just blood lead. So we, we did clip feathers with all those birds. We haven't analyzed that yet. But a feather can give you, you know, a secondary would take three to four weeks to grow at a certain time of year. So it, it's you know, a little, little more, maybe even six weeks. And then to validate this, the lead care machine for each one of these species, catch enough red tails, enough rough leggeds, enough Swainson's hawks, enough ferruginous hawks to actually have to validate this. Um, and I don't know if I included that graph, but uh, some people have looked, like uh, Beringia South, have looked into ravens and realized that there's a deviation between the true value with ravens and the actual the lead care value. But it's a consistent deviation that can be accounted for mathematically. Basically, the lead care seems to bias low. As the, as the rates, as the levels get higher. But there's legal implications with, with this work. Um, you know, lawsuits about lead poisoning, saying, oh, I, you know, I'm challenging this, it's, it's not real. You, know, you better make sure that if you're in the business of doing lead research is that you know, validating it with a mass spectrometer, mass, this is a mass spectrometer would, is really important to have, have that in your data set for legal purposes and also for, uh, with respect to take. Like an eagle's you know, found with poisoning and it's an actual uh, law enforcement issue. It, it's also good to have this validation. And this is really probably the most interesting part of it that really is the big unknown is physiology. So what does, these, what does background lead levels mean to a bird? We know with a human, the CDC has, and I think the EPA maybe has said that five five micrograms per deciliter, which is, is the threshold for a child. So that's very low, but they know at five, there's cognitive impairment. That's a, that's a level that action should be taken with the, with the child. But with a lot of these birds, we don't know what it means. And so to actually look at that, um, the things like ALAD. ALAD is the precursor to hemoglobin, and lead depresses ALAD. So that's one way to look at it, say, well, at 
X micrograms per deciliter, it depresses a lad like this. That means that that bird doesn't want to. And I've seen it in falconry birds that have been accidentally lead poisoned from game meat that they've caught. Um, they don't want to fly, even if it's low levels. They're just like, ugh, they don't feel good. And uh, with ravens and vultures, lead seems to impair this corticosterone, which is, uh, has to do with stress. So there's ways that the research community can hopefully figure out these thresholds, to figure out what these lead levels mean physiologically to birds. And just to talk a little bit about you know, ammunition, it's out of my, you know, I'm, I'm, we're doing more just research, but, but it's important to, to relay some of this information, I think. And, and non-lead alternatives are very abundant now for the majority of hunting that, that hunters do and shooting we do, there's a lot of alternatives. Um, and so here's a, you know, also a price point difference recently that realized that the, price po the prices are not as far apart as we think. That this is uh, non-lead, non uh, all non-lead is essentially premium ammunition, so you have to kind of compare apples to apples. But the prices are getting better. The, the, the only lead smelter in the United States was closed down. So lead's actually going up in price now. So it's, it's the, the economics are, you know, are changing a little bit. The availability is increasing. But this is the deal, is that these solid copper bullets don't fragment. They peel back like a banana, but they don't fragment. There's other types of non-lead that are frangible, but they're, they're uh, compressed non-lead, non-toxic powder, alloy powder that are compressed. And they hit an animal, and they, they're frangible, so they're safer to use for wildlife damage control. Um, so there's a variety of different things. They're not just solid copper bullets, but this whole industry started by Barnes from a bunch of hardcore reloaders that wanted to make a better performing bullet. That's all it was about. It wasn't about saving wildlife. It was about really hardcore reloaders that were trying to design a bullet with a ballistic coefficient to make it fly better, perform better. And so the science behind these types of bullets is, and, and why they work the way they do, it's, it's a strong case for it. And anybody that shot them a lot realizes you can usually shoot better, get better performance um, for the most part. You just have to experiment like you do with anything. So to just go over some acknowledgments here, the field crew on the research we talked about uh, was Leona Brodeur, John Nelson, Sarah Norton, John Pierce, Mason Wagner, and, and, and uh, but I'll give a special call out to John Nelson because he deserved it. John caught probably, you know, I've done a lot of raptor trapping, but I didn't have time to spend with John, and he, he probably caught 70% of, of all of our birds out of four people. Um, and then we had funding by USGS, uh, US Fish and Wildlife, and, and the High Desert Museum, and support and coordination from David Leal and Brian Woodbridge. And the sources, Peregrine Fund, Brangia South, Fish and Wildlife Service, USGS, photo credits there. But I wanted to also provide some more information to you guys. If you're interested in finding this peer-reviewed work, here are some links up here. And there's a lot of information through these portals. You can find a lot of papers and, and abstracts. And, and then for information about non-lead ammunition, uh, there's some huntingwithnonlead.org is a great site. There's a lot of stuff there. This is a really good video produced by a, somebody that worked on the Condor Project who's a pretty serious hunter, and it's, I recommend checking out that video, too. Yes? Anything toxic about the copper? That's, yeah. That's a good point. To copper's toxic, you know, but the key thing is sort of the mechanism of delivery. It doesn't fragment. So if, by chance, uh, a, you know, a bird ingested a cop that one copper slug, it probably is not great for the bird, but the probability is really low, and it's, it's in a very solid piece, so the, the volume is, as, with respect to surface area, is much different. But yeah, there, the alternatives to solid copper are that compressed powder, powderized alloys, like tin and different types of alloys that are in a powder, and they compress it at high heat, and it's a frangible bullet. If you look up on the barn site, I believe it's called like the varmint grenade or something, and it's, um, but it's totally non-lead. So. Uh, have you ever thought of, of in the ground squirrel shoots uh, having requiring non-lead ammunition in one area uh, that is far enough in distance that you're not going to get a crossover right. with raptor birds 
scavenging both, but have one and then compare the results? That's what, ideally, I mean, that's sort of a little bit what Beringia South did with that big game hunt, is they were actually able to provide hunters in a kind of experimental study, provide them with non-lead ammo. When I worked, well, I was working, trying to work on a project with them where we were gonna do that on a shooting club, and we were trying to get the buy-in of the owner to do it, um, but it, it's, we, yeah, that's a great way to do it. Um, it requires, basically what we're hoping to do is you find a shooting guide that does a lot of these shoots at a high volume and get their buy-in and say, we'll provide the ammo to you if you will only shoot this with your clients on these pivots or something like that. But, but that's, that's ideal design. You mentioned the economics of lead and non-lead ammunition. What are the other arguments for people? You know, you were saying people buying in for using non-lead ammunition. If it performs better and the economics are close, what are the objections? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, when I was a kid and I was shooting um, steel for the first time. You know, what we I didn't really realize at the time is you have to change your choke tubes on your barrels. They have to you have to have like an open choke tube because when steel goes through the choke, it it bounces off of each other instead of compress. And so it took time for the shooting, the waterfowling community to realize how to just you know, put different, the right choke tubes in, for example. With rifles, it's similar. Um, you, have to, you might have to experiment a little bit. It's cultural. You know, let, people have been shooting lead a long time. They know how it shoots through their gun. They know they can buy this box of ammo for 26 bucks and it shoots this way. So it requires a little bit of experimentation. Um, to, to I guess to say that there are some valid arguments with you know I can't find a box of twenty a brick of twenty two shells at all in non lead or it's very difficult to find it in some of the more either very small room fire or very large calibers availability is always tough with ammunition um, but really it's about education um, most of the hunters most of the time can find non lead ammunition that is great but it just requires education um, and realizing that. You know, this stuff is, there's a lot of stuff out there like, oh, barrel twist rates are not designed for these ammunition. It's not true. Um, it just requires education. So the Arizona, the state of Arizona has done a great job in their Condor project, project with doing an, edu an educational program in northern Arizona. And that's very successful. But they do lots of shoots. They hand out ammunition. It, it's, it, takes, it takes time. Yeah, and that's an argument that is out there for sure, and a lot of groups talk about that that as a way to per be persuade. It's like, look, this lead fragment is, is and I think I had a slide in there of x-rayed uh, venison packages where there's lead fragments in the package. Um, I don't, I think it's a little bit of a mistake in the sense that the human physiology is so different than raptors that I try to focus on raptors and say, look, we, raptors can, are very vulnerable to this. Humans may or may not be, I mean, we know they're, you know, there's been some studies about ingesting uh, wild game, and you know, but the, the, the data is not as definitive. And so some people want to talk about that, and I tend to just focus on birds of prey, and, um, just because that physiology is so unique um, compared to people. But there's an argument there, because like we, we know that five micrograms per deciliter is, impairs cognitive ability in a, in a growing child. So. I'm a retired veterinarian. I did wildlife rehab, but I mostly did small animals and uh, pets. And there wasn't a month in my practice that I didn't treat a lead poison pet. Mm -hmm. And parrots and birds with chewing beaks like parakeets and cockatiels will chew on uh, the sink, powder coated uh, dishes, they'll mm -hmm. chew on the solder of the cages, they'll chew on toys. Uh, the things that grab uh, the, you know, the color bones, uh, costume jewelry, and it only takes a piece of lead the size of a grain of sand for the poison of that bird. And when you x-ray a bird, you may or may not see the lead. It passes through quickly. But it is in their body, and they become anemic. And a bird's hematocrit, the percentage of red blood cells is about 50%. And I've had birds come in with 5% red blood cells on the verge of death, you know, if you chelate them. So uh, we don't call it blood poisoning, we call it heavy metal poisoning because it's the same with zinc, 
same with copper, it's the same with lead. So um, not having experience as a hunter in the field or your, um, your vocation, I would be very suspicious that copper is going to be any better other than it has a fragment. It's not going to be the panacea. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't know that it would be the, that, but it's really the mechanism is very specific. It's the fact that these dust-sized particles are traveling 18 inches from the entry hole into the viscera or into the offals. Um, so it's a, I think that you know, just from the, the actual physical mechanism of how these particles are getting to the bird, you know, it's, it, 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 would, it may not be the panacea, but it would be a dramatic reduction. It would be a dramatic reduction, but for someone who just uh, doesn't really care about science, you know, Joe Blow who wants to go out and shoot, he goes, oh, I'm not doing any problems. I guess he is. He's leaving that, that metal in the environment. Um, and if anybody needs that piece of, you know, you wouldn't need a bullet. Yeah, but you wouldn't. There's there's very little chance of ingesting a, a slug that size in any. You know what I mean? It's it's the chances of, you know, ingesting a slug that's essentially bigger than your molar is. But it's still poison. So that's what I like to let everybody right. know. Because a guy in Crane who doesn't really give, a you know what about this issue thinks he's well, I'm better. Yeah, I know. I, I hear what you're saying. I would be. I would still sort of assert that the, the solution, solid copper and other non-toxics, are significant solution to this to this particular problem. And I like to echo that because that solid lead, or sorry, excuse me, solid copper bullet is much more recoverable. The hunter can go in from the carcass and get it if it didn't pass through, so they can clean it out, not leave it in the oval, not have it in the, their processed meat. So as far as that goes, they can recover that bullet a lot more than they can recover any of those fragments from the lead. They can recover the whatever thirty percent that's left over from the lead slug, but they can't recover all of that. Yeah. You mentioned a uh, treatment being chelating the birds. For us non-scientists, exactly what is that? It, it's a, you know, and I actually, there's probably people in the room that can answer that chemically better than me, but it's a chemical that they, you inject into the bird and it binds to lead and the bird excretes lead, essentially poops it out, excretes it. And so it's um, a process that it's used for other he heavy metals that, that she was talking about and not just lead. Um, so, yeah. Penicillin and calcium EPTA. And penicillin is given orally for on again, off again, because it's toxic to the liver. The calcium EPTA is given by injection. And again, you give them on again and off again, because those are poisonous as well. And so it requires hospitalization, and it requires about three weeks of therapy. And in the meantime, you're force feeding the bird, and hydrating the bird, and taking care of the bird. Yeah, the Condor crew, you know, I know I have some friends in the Condor crew that do this. You know, and they capture these birds, and they take them in, they hold them, and they put, chelate them. And it's, it's heartbreaking when you get to know them and you get to realize personally what they go through with the, this, these birds and this endangered species. It starts because they get really upset when they think of the idea of releasing condors in a place that has lead in the environment um, because they're doing this every day. And it was sort of an, an eye-opener to me. So, it, yes? Yeah, I just have a question about, um, you use the term background um, for 10 micrograms or, or less. Um, do we really know what the quote unquote natural uh, background is? There's back, there is no natural, but it should not be there. So yeah. perhaps that word is not for it, it, Well, the, what background means, not to mean that background is meaning just kind of it's out there, but background means is just a terminology that toxicologists use to say that the bird was exposed, but it's not, it's sort of, you know, below what we would consider something that the bird would be symptomatic. You know, like maybe subclinical would be slightly symptomatic, and clinical is definitely very obvious, and the bird, the bird's acting really weird. Right, but like with children, um, that level has, when we spend a little bit more time on it. Right, we, we, we have better data. Coming down, and, and certainly yeah. health professionals today would say there's no level of lead that doesn't... Because we, we can give an IQ test to a kid, and yeah, we can't to a condor, so, yeah. <laughs>
uh, no, but, but it points to the fact that that is a huge vacuum of knowledge. Like, we don't know what that low level is to them. Like, it could actually mean very subtle things that this bird is going in and trying to figure out how to catch jackrabbits. It may mean that bird can't figure out how to catch jackrabbit and it dies of starvation in its immature year because it has that background level. We don't know. But yeah. did it, I'm just going through that, those graphs again. Did that show that every single bird had lead? That was a threshold graph that shows that, um, yeah, it showed that basically, no, 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 it didn't show that. It was basically saying that, that the percentages of birds that had some level of exposure, yeah. For ravens, for ravens, yeah. One more question. Yeah. I was just gonna point out um, that, that whatever level you're getting is just a spot check also. We have to remember that. And some of these, when you're getting a low, Level, it may be right, right. but it's just, if, if you have that robust sample size and your, your level of effort over time and space is in your sample size is big, then that works out in the wash. Yeah. yeah. In the sense, yeah, but, but that deparation rate is you could be sampling that bird on its 28th day after exposure and, and that's at two, but the bird was at like 100. But if you're, the only way to get around that is to have a huge sample size of, and, and an unbiased design, relatively speaking. But even if it isn't recoverable in blood, the lead is not excreted. It's bioaccumulates, so that bird, if, yeah. It's in their bones, liver, yep. It's affecting them in other ways, so the, but it's not going away, but it just, what the blood lead analysis allows you to do is correlate with, over, across time and say that bird was definitely exposed. Yes. Well, thank you guys. If, uh, feel free to ask, ask, answer any questions later.